So next we're going to explore um, quite a fundamental concept of private markets uh, and how that is changing. And that concept is that patience is required. After all, the, the playbook has taught LPs to lock away capital and wait for the returns. But the pace of fundraising and the speed at which assets have traded has shortened the investment horizons, which begs the question of whether patience is still a virtue. To explore this more, I'm going to invite Gordon Bajnai of Campbell Lutyens to interrogate whether a new playbook is needed. And we're going to have representatives of private equity, private debt, and infrastructure um, to comment on uh, patience versus velocity. So please welcome Gordon to the stage. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so my name is Gordon Boyne. I am the global head of infrastructure at Campbell Hutchins. As you know, we are a private capital advisor across three asset classes, private equity, private credit, and infrastructure. And that maybe is the reason why I've been asked to moderate a panel where you can meet all the three angles of these three asset classes by a very senior uh, team of, of experts, doers, executors. So. Let me invite uh, to the stage uh, Martin Bradley, who is heading uh, Macquarie's uh, European Asset Management uh, business. And then uh, Armen Panosian, who is uh, the head of the performing credit uh, uh, business of Oak Tree, who flew all the way from Los Angeles to meet us. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Nadim El Gabbani from Blackstone, who came only from London, from a short distance, but he's a senior managing director in the private equity business there. And our topic today is going to be patient capital, or some of you probably like to call it uh, long-term capital. So let me take a seat with you guys. And uh, maybe start with a very quick 30-second introduction, just that people know who they are listening to. Martin, you want to start from there? Am I on? I'm Martin Bradley. Um, I look after real assets for Macquarie, which is Mira for anyone who's who's a little bit older. Um, so I've been there 10 years, and before that, spent 20 years plus in investment banking. I'm Armen Panosian, is this on? Uh, and I oversee the performing credit businesses at Oak Tree Capital Management, which includes tradable credit areas, predominantly in below investment grade. Uh, uh, credit instruments, as well as illiquid opportunities such as uh, direct lending and other hard asset-based lending. Nadim. And uh, Nidhi Malgabeni, I'm with Blackstone. I've been with the firm for 14 years. Uh, I sit within the private equity team where I look after business services, technology, and financial services uh, across both our, uh, our uh, flagship buyout fund as well as our long-term capital fund. Thank you very much to all of you. Before going into the details, probably the first question is the same to all of you, each one of you is, it would be helpful to understand that from the specific sector where you are coming from, what does patient capital or call it long-term capital mean? Why is it relevant in that sector? And where is it today that it's gone through some evolution in the last probably decade, but where is it today in your given sector? And maybe. It's very different for private equity, very different in, in private credit, and, 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 and of course, infrastructure. Maybe it's most natural to think of long-term capital and infrastructure, given the nature of assets. So why don't we start with Martin and then get to the more mundane jobs? Yes, yeah, so the, the question is, um, is, is long-term capital relevant to us, or how is it relevant to us? And, and in infrastructure, that's got to be yes. Um, very simply put, and if I stay we blend at some stage between private equity and infrastructure. So if I stay more in the core ethos, um, we're looking for assets where we can invest in the long term and we can put more capital to work. And we talk about things like productivity and we talk less about efficiency. Uh, what does that mean? It means the assets we invest in fundamentally, they don't have or they shouldn't have readily accessible upsides either from repositioning or from turnaround, we shouldn't be buying businesses which which are turn well. They shouldn't be turnaround stories, but we certainly shouldn't be buying them if they are sort of turnaround stories. Such as the nature of that equity. Consequently, we're not offering that sort of twenty percent IRR, double your money in three years. We shouldn't be because if you can double your money, you can lose it as well. Um, Instead, we look at a, a, a longer term horizon. We bring stability of cash flows. We're looking for yield. We're looking to invest more 
into those assets and grow them. And hence, for the same population, we're looking to double the size of the assets and we talk about productivity. That's not to say we don't, get, we don't address inefficiencies, but it's not a core driver of value. Thank you very much. The other end of the spectrum is private credit, which is typically very short, uh, four, five to seven years turnaround. So what's the notion of long-term or patient capital in your business? Yeah, I mean, in credit, there are so many sub-asset classes that it means different things depending on which credit area you're looking at. And as you mentioned, in private credit, typically speaking, the maturities are five to seven years. The experience around rotation of portfolios is usually three to five years in terms of actual uh, you know, loans staying in the portfolio. So in terms of patient capital in private credit, it means taking on potentially extension risk around what was historically a shorter term uh, you know, velocity around those positions. On the other extreme within credit would be investment grade bonds, where you know, the average duration is closer to eight years now, but there are certainly investment grade bonds that have 12, 15 year maturities, 20 year maturities left in corporate credit. And in that case, um, the, 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 the element of patient capital is really avoidance or, or not caring insensitivity around mark to market movements and instead favoring companies that are low in credit risk and, um, and will recover you know, principal and interest as it comes due. There certainly is a, a, an opportunity in investment grade bonds right now to buy highly discounted bonds. Um, and for patient investors that are willing to hold those bonds to maturity or near maturity and not have duration oriented sensitivity around mark to market, there certainly is an opportunity there. But those are the two bookends. There's the really short end in private credit where I think that um, there may be some building of credit risk and, and therefore I think patient capital ought to be slower to deploy in private credit in the, over the next year or two versus what it has done in the last three years. And then on the other extreme, high quality investment grade bonds that um, will probably not have a meaningful default experience but will have some mark to market weakness and potentially under earning against expectations over the next few years. So Nadim, Blackstone was one of the founders of the whole private asset class, alternative asset class, and one of the creators of the classic 10 year or 10 plus two years maximum private equity duration. But the, you were also one of the first guys who actually a couple of years ago moved beyond that duration and created the longer hold. In private equity where this buyout is typically about sort of uh, value add and, and, and creating capital gains, what, what's the point in having longer term assets? Why don't you just turn them around in 10 years to be provocative? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, we, as you said, we did start out and, and our flagship funds are in, within private equity very much are holding assets for on average kind of four to seven years. And, you know, our history there was doing things that were operationally intensive, taking businesses on a transformation journey, uh, you know, not buying businesses that were distressed, at least not on purpose, um, but, uh, but buying businesses where there was clear upside of things you could do within a few years that would radically increase the value of that, of that business, ideally by managing, well, managing risk very prudently along the way. Uh, our journey towards long-term capital really came about because as we looked at our opportunities within private equity, we saw a subset, so not every company, but a subset of businesses that were sufficiently high quality that we would love to be owners of those businesses you know, for a very long period of time. And they tend to have a few characteristics. They tend to be companies that are extraordinarily meaningful to their end markets and their customers. They tend to have you know, very strong moats around them, so think uh, intellectual property that, that is difficult to re uh, replicate, market positions uh, that are, have developed over the course of decades that are extremely unlikely to be displaced, uh, an insensitivity to technological disintermediation. So businesses that might be on the, in the process of disrupting an industry typically very slowly if we're going to own it for a, a long period of time. Um, but for these types of companies, which we think can price above inflation consistently that hold very high relative market shares in their industry. Um, we were, you know, we would see them as private equity investors and some cases we would be lucky enough to own them, but then we would have to sell them and that made us sad. And so what we broadly decided to do was create a vehicle where we could own these businesses for, you know, roundabouts 15 years, uh, continue to execute value-added activities, but the reality is, as we invest in these types of companies, 
uh, you tend not to have to do as much to continue to make them great. They tend to start out as great businesses. Um, and so as a result, you know, you end up with uh, a portfolio of businesses that we believe are of the highest quality that we identified. Um, typically, in our case, we've chosen to do it in a relatively concentrated way with the same team that has the expertise across the sectors that we invest in the, the regular part of the private equity business. Um, but if we do that right, we end up with a differentiated group of companies that we're very happy to own for a long time and that we think provide uh, a way for our LPs to you know, own businesses that, you know, frankly speaking, they may not be able to do uh, without such a vehicle. So in private equity, it's say 15 years, roughly, that is considered to be patient compared to the classic private equity. Model. Yeah, roughly speaking, yes. And, and you know, te it tends to be, as we're underwriting them, the reliance is a little bit less on the operational value add. How do you radically change how this company is, is delivering its services to its customers? Uh, and much more about the initial conditions, like how good is this industry? How good is this company's place in this industry? Um, are we very, very confident that we are not taking binary risks uh, around regulation, you know, sensitivity to macroeconomic changes? Of course, if you're investing across 15 years, you will not have a predictive model of how that looks. Uh, you need to be very confident that you know, if, the world, if the world changes from a low interest rate environment to a high interest rate environment, to tee up your next question, I think, um, you have a portfolio of assets that will react to that in a predictable way. Um, and you know where you know you don't wake up ten years from now and discover that this business that you thought would have a market position that was unassailable is suddenly being attacked by a digital uh, in, uh, new entrant that is doing terrible things to your company that you didn't predict. So say fifteen years in private equity, I mean it's about seven moving to ten years. If that's what patient capital. Is. Sure, it, it depends on which asset class, but yeah, I mean it's uh, seven to ten years is about right. I think it's more in credit, it's more about, it's not really about necessarily duration or length of, of time that is the definition of patience. It's more about whether you are going to be willing to do one of two things. One of them would be to sustain mark to market movements as long as you are convinced that you will recover principal on your position. So that applies to investment grade. Sounds very similar to your long dated private equity fund in terms of mentality. The other option is to sit on cash and to really be um, opportunistic in a way to step into the markets as they experience some, some defaults or other kind of more technical stress. And that is also patience. Patience in the form of uh, not investing only when, or only for the times where the knife is falling most rapidly. And so, and in infrastructure, it's that you have open-ended funds, so basically endless funds, which is probably the dream of uh, that would of, be amazing. Of Blackstone. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they, they, they well. come with their own complications. Um, look, open-ended funds. We we should start this conversation somewhere else, which is what does the LP want? Okay, um, so we believe that having a stock of highly investable perpetual assets. Um, and liquidity for the LP to come in and out of is a good thing. Okay, um, we then need the performance of those assets to demonstrate that. And it, it's quite interesting as as private equity comes one way, sort of looking for the higher quality assets where they can go to a longer maturity. Uh, we're going the other way as an industry, which is um, moving out of what I would call infrastructure, which is the perpetual irreplaceable assets, and then looking for the good business plans that we can be comfortable with, and then deciding how long are we comfortable with that risk profile. We've got a different perspective in that, you know, we're comparing it always to something which is irreplaceable in our view. Um, so we, we come slightly in. So we go from perpetual. Personally, I think anything over 15, 20 years is long term, and everything else is just marketing, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, most people here, 20 years will probably see us um, in a whole new paradigm. And I have no idea what that looks like. That perfectly sets me up for the second question with the new paradigm. But before going there, I just want to give the early warning to the audience that after this second round of questions, I'd like to open the floor for questions. So please think about what you want to ask from the audience in a short form. But um, uh, so the second topic, new paradigm. At Campbell Hutchins, we believe that we are actually at a huge inflection point at the moment. With inflation after many, many years returning, government interventions, regulation uh, returning. 
efficiency with deglobalization or regionalization being reduced in the interest of strategic resilience and research, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a huge switch in the macro environment. What does it mean for long-term capital when many LPs are thinking about the next six months, not the next 15, 20 years? Which strategies within, can patient capital be a winner in this new environment? And if yes, why? And which parts, who, who could be the winners? Let's start from now, from the private equity side and go the other direction, Nadine. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I, we would agree that certainly the current macro environment is different than what it's looked like you know, for the last 20 years with interest rates that have, brought, broadly speaking, gone down throughout. Um, I would say we have been concerned about the historically low cost of capital for a very long period of time. Uh, we were wrong about that for like the first six years that we complained about it, and you know we seem to be vindicated today. Um, but we have been very concerned that businesses that did not have pricing power, that did not have the ability to uh, be to command a premium from their customers in excess of what they had to pay their costs of input, uh, would ultimately not be sustainable businesses. Uh, and so, when we think about all that within private equity, that means one thing. When we think about it for a business that we might own for 15 years across one cycle, two cycles, however many we have during that period, uh, it becomes more acute. And you know that level of you know that level of stress means that you spend a lot of time up front thinking about what are the inputs that could create uh, a radically different world uh, and how does this business respond to it? How has it responded to it historically? Because a lot of the businesses we are looking at have been around for a very long period of time. Um, and how is it likely to if we, you know, if we think hypothetically? You know, the good news is we tend to buy businesses that have you know, irreplaceable market positions. You know, when we buy uh, when we buy Merlin Entertainment, which is the you know, second largest owner of theme parks and, and location-based entertainment in the world, you know, the London Eye is not disappearing tomorrow. These are irreplaceable assets. You know, people will want to do this. This is not, the changes that we see in today's environment may impact what we have to pay our suppliers and how, how fast we have to raise prices to our consumers uh, and what our investments in technology and digital will have to be over the future. But they don't change the nature of these companies. We're not trying to take that kind of risk in our long-term funds, and we think that's critically important. Yeah, and I would say in credit, we try to lend to those types of companies. The companies that don't go away, the companies that don't cycle harder than GDP. In fact, we usually try to find companies that don't cycle at all. Obviously, it's hard to it's hard to do that. But one of the areas of investing that I oversee within private credit is life sciences, and life sciences in particular is a nice differentiator, uncorrelated with GDP. At the end of the day, the performance of life sciences companies that are curing cancer is how good are they at scientific innovation. So that's one way to introduce an uncorrelated industry to an otherwise fairly pro-cyclical portfolio. Um, but credit, so picking credit, picking good credit that isn't going to default is job number one for a credit investor. But I would say in the short run, and this has been true for the better part of this year, rates expectations have overwhelmed much of credit. Um, price movements and high yield bonds and senior loans, if you look at them this year, sure, there's been some spread widening. But, but the most violent month to month movements in those industries has really been after a Fed announcement, which we're going to have one again tomorrow. So we'll see how the markets do. But in the long run, I think there is a bigger concern that switches from rate sensitivity to credit sensitivity. And that's the following way. If we are in a period of time over the next 40 years where rates are higher than they have been in the last 40, 40 years we've just seen downward pressure on rates you know, pretty consistently year to year. But if in the next 40 years we're at just higher rates, there's, there are going to be credit issues that emerge in companies, in asset bubbles, that I think the Fed and, and just central banks globally are going to have to consider. How much pain are they willing to inflict on portfolios? How much pain are they willing to inf inflict on real estate portfolios or even on infrastructure assets that you know, potentially have to roll liabilities into an environment that is not as conducive? Um, you know, if, if the 10-year Treasury is at 3.5% on its way to 4.5%, it had bottomed at 1.6%, 1.5% a couple of years ago. If homeowners, if commercial real estate owners need to refinance into a rate environment that's 200 or 300 basis points higher than where they placed that debt two, three, four years ago, you should expect to see credit problems. 
So you should expect to see defaults and losses in that type of higher rate environment. So the question becomes back to the regulators is how much of that are you willing to put on the economy? And so for now in the short run, again, it's a rate, you know, rates are overwhelming anything credit oriented, but over time, I think it's gonna go the opposite direction. So from a credit investor standpoint, from an oak tree standpoint, um, we're very much focused on downside protection and, and really uh, dampening volatility and cyclicality in our portfolios. Martin, uh, uh, interest rates up, inflation is up. Infrastructure is supposed to be protected against inflation, but does it re is it reflected on the long term portfolios? Uh, yeah. So the, the 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 immediate answer to that is we our portfolios are doing well in this climate. Um, I want to come back to a few things you said. There's a profound change. I think there is. Um, in China, we are we we we've got used to China being giving us unlimited. Um, supply chain economics, that's gone. Okay, it's either gone from globalization or from what's happening in China itself. And we in the Western world don't really know what that means. Okay, what that, what, how that will feed through and whether or not other developing nations will be able to step in and sort of fill the gap. Um, so I think we are to profound um, state of change and, and we're definitely thinking about that in, in the context of our portfolios to a point of maybe pausing a little bit in our investment rates um, this year and, and looking for those opportunities that you mentioned, which I think will, will appear over the next 24 months. And that's fine. That's okay. We have, um, if I come back to your, your exam question about inflation and uh, uh, interest rates, we've got about 160 something companies, um, third of them are in Europe. You know, across that, I'm 65 billion of equity. We've probably got about a billion in GDP, okay? Which we unwind the positions in GDP in about 2017, 18, which feels very clever at the minute. But at the time, it was a, it was a very high market. And we thought with, um, with the level of government debts, government would be pre, pre, predisposed to allowing inflation to grow. Okay, that was the view we took, and we launched a utility fund, and we launched various other initiatives around capturing capturing that inflation. So, we've got about sixty percent of the portfolio in in renewable energy and energy networks, all of which is inflation protected. Um, our biggest issue at the minute is is making sure we strike the balance right between those assets doing what they should be doing under the regulatory formula, but when your regulatory formula is geared towards two percent that we bought on. And you're earning 10% or 14%, you know, there's an affordability question that we we will be called to answer, um, and we're working with the regulators now in terms of trying to trying to uh, represent. Do you that see regular, having been in government side for a couple of years myself? Uh, do you see the regulatory behavior changed compared to the GFC 12 years ago when they were quite brutal sometimes and going against even sort of uh, so low, their own laws? We were, you know, we were we were foolish. You know, I've lived through lived through a few crises. GFC being the largest. Before I did this role, I, I looked after our capital, um, and those crises are always around the corner. We forget about them, but they come. They come and they come in different shapes and sizes. In the um, in the uh, early two thousands, I think the entire equity world, private equity as well as infrastructure, which was quite a new new kid on the block, we we're quite arrogant. You know, we ran up quite large leverage positions. Uh, we thought the day was it was going to grow forever, and it didn't. Okay, and we got hit by that. And in that, um, we were ill-prepared to be to play our role in society, okay, in, in terms of our actions and our words. Um, coming to this, coming to this stage in 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 the cycle, we're definitely being more proactive. We use a language set of um, investing with purpose. So we 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 cover across that decarbonization digitization, um, and, and then GDP demographics, where we trade in and out, depending on the market. But in those core macros, sustainable macros, we're alongside the government talking about the energy crisis and how we move to hydrogen, the energy crisis, and how we roll out EVs, what can we do for the households. And then there's a trade-off of what do we need to make that happen? And then it comes back to your first question, over the longer term, how does that profile of returns work? Whereas if you asked us 20 years ago, we wanted the money today. Let me turn to the audience here. Uh, please 
Put your hands up if anybody has a I have lots of questions, but uh, I want to prefer you if you have any questions based on what we heard so far. Uh, so a quick check before I move on. Anybody? Question? Yeah, there is one. Please introduce yourself and very be very short because we have six, seven minutes. Hello, everybody. It's good to see your family office. Uh, one quick question. Uh, is it changing well with the inflation? Lots of parameters, uh, the, uh, the fees, especially the hurdle, which is kind of a fixed rate. Should we have a hurdle that moves alongside inflation or interest rates? That's something that's more reflecting the emotion of the market, especially for the term. That's a very good question. Just for those who couldn't hear it, so the question is: With increased inf interest rates and inflation rates, should the hurdles and the fee the rates move up or be flexible? Who wants to take that uh, I, I, question? I, 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 I'll have a quick. There is a discussion with investors when we come to market about what they want in that current market condition. If we went to the investors and said, "Look, um, uh, if rates fall, we're going to reduce your returns," okay. That, that's the other side of the equation that, that would be unpalatable. Um, therefore, we tend to sort of think we enter into a, a sort of transparent, open uh, economic discussion with the, the LPs um, where we will put out a 10 to 15 year investment plan, which will have that fixed rate component and fixed fees, and we'll invest that into the market, the prevailing market. Okay. Um, if the investors want that product, they'll buy it and we'll launch it. If they don't want that product, we'll adjust it to, to what they want. That's just a straightforward, as part of the fundraising, that's, that's all part of the discussion. But my experience is no, one's, no one really wants the downside. Everyone wants the upside. I don't think anyone wants the downside. Anybody has a, another question, another topic to raise? If not, I don't see any hands up. Then I want to also ask Nadim, and maybe Armin is is that you're, you're I'm just following from this question. Your long-term strategies have different fee structures, as I understand, uh, than the, the sort of classic ten-year strategies. Is that correct? We do. We have a different uh, we have a different fee structure in our long-term fund. It is lower than uh, in our regular fund. Uh, we've chosen to do that because at the end of the day. When we're investing into a you know operational transformation focused buyout fund, uh, we tend to earn higher returns as a result of making those changes early in the investment period, uh, and then capitalizing those changes kind of three to five years later. Uh, within a 15-year period, the businesses will continue to compound over a long time, but they they don't tend to have that step change of uh, performance, uh, which is then taken out as a multiple of that uh, when we sell the company. It's a much longer period of time, and so as a result. Uh, our LPs, we believe, are looking for a lower return from these types of product, and predominantly, they're looking to avoid reinvestment risk on these high, very high quality businesses. And so, as a result, you know, we've chosen to invest out of our uh, with the same team that looks after private equity, uh, which opens it up and allows us uh, to effectively charge a lower fee on the long-term capital. Because the question we ask ourselves when we meet any business is, is this a high enough quality business that we would want to own it for 15 years? If so, we think about it for the long-term fund. If not, then we look at it and just try to decide if there is a transformation thesis that allows us to invest in it in private equity. Yeah, I, I would just say that um, in our commingled vehicles, generally, we do have a fixed hurdle. It, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher, depending on the long-term return expectations around the particular asset class. We do, however, have evergreen structures, some that are separately managed account format that we do have a floating rate hurdle um, tied to sometimes LIBOR, but um, it isn't something that I think, similar to what Martin was saying, I mean, we want to do, we want to deliver the according to client expectations. So if they do, if our fee structure is something that is inconsistent with recent history or is inconsistent with the expectations, then we will have to adjust, is the short, the short of it. But, our, but I would also say that generally speaking, other than our evergreen structures, our funds are relatively short. I mean, our funds have a 10-year fund life at most at Oak Tree. They usually have a three or four-year investment period, and a very large portion of the investments are liquid and exitable soon thereafter or right after the investment period is over. So the return of capital is or the velocity around it is fairly quick, and therefore the a fixed hurdle versus a floating one usually is not a, the first conversation that, that a client brings up. We have three minutes, two and a half minutes left, so a quick roundup asking each one of you one, one specific thing is, if you need to bet based on your well-informed 
uh, industry view in your own asset class in a kind of five years time? Do you expect that long-term patient capital models will outgrow the normal pace, pace, uh, pace of uh, AUM growth in the sector or underperform in terms of growth or just be on, on the curve and why? So, I mean, I would say they're starting, long-term capital within private equity is starting from a much lower base than regular private equity is today. And so my expectation is it will grow faster. Uh, I don't think in 15 or 20 years it will be a bigger portion of the market uh, than operationally focused transformational private equity. Uh, but I do think over the next five to 10 years it will become a bigger and bigger piece of the market. And we do see competitors you know, starting to launch products uh, that look similar to what you know, we, we pioneered a few years ago. I mean, for, for, for Oak Tree, I think it will grow faster. Um, and patient capital specifically is defined by taking advantage of distressed opportunities, special situations, trigger accounts or dislocation capture accounts. Effectively, committed capital to funds that, are, that have individuals, that have professionals trained to catch a falling knife. Um, that, for us, I think, first of all, it's a core competency for Oak Tree. But given what's happening against this market backdrop, I would expect that that would be a very uh, large growth area for us versus traditional you know, credit or traditional other asset classes. Yes, yeah, slightly different approach. Um, our North Star is the macros. Um, we're in, a, in an investment cycle at the minute around the sustainability, decarbonization, digitization that is probably as large as it's ever been from the Second World War. Um, and that's our North Star. We will keep investing into that. We'll, we'll stay close to our mandate. We believe there's enough in that space for us to do. And I think if we, we stay close to our knitting, to, to use the metaphor, then, um, then we can stay out of the worst of the, worst of the, the uncertainties that are to come. Um, and it's been a, a very successful portfolio, portfolio play for us to date. Thank you very much. I think in this environment, as the, you heard from the insiders of the industry, the best thing you can do in an, at an inflection point is try to think long term and look through the current troubles and, uh, and insecurities. Thank you very much for those insights. I hope we help the audience uh, to steer better uh, the boat in the coming storms. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.